So hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, from whatever time zone you may be calling us in from today. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Rebecca Cronin, and I'm one of the customer success managers here with the Altair Data Analytics team. Now, some of you might recognize my voice uh, from either participating in some of our onboarding sessions or perhaps seeing my name within the user community. Uh, the customer success team, we're here as another point of contact for you and your organization to reach out to at any time if you're not able to get a hold of your account manager or you're not sure where to go to locate some resources. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, if you haven't joined our user community and you're having trouble getting connection, uh, again, that's another area that we can assist you with. Uh, so a little housekeeping on the side for those that might be new to our presentation. Uh, you should see a, a handouts section. Uh, there you'll find a copy of today's PowerPoint, so you can download that and have it for reference. It has some of those helpful web links that we'll be sharing. As well as uh, you'll see a question panel. Uh, so today's topic, we're actually going to start with Monarch Server. It's a quick overview of a basic process with an input and output distribution. Uh, but today you could ask any questions regarding uh, not just Monarch Server, or as we like to call it, Automator, but also Monarch, the, uh, the desktop client. Uh, so don't be shy. Feel free to leverage that question panel there. Even if we haven't started and you have a question you want to make sure we get to it, go ahead and feel free to type in that question and we'll do our best to cover it. If it's something that you would like for us to answer offline and private, then make sure you add that comment when you submit the question. Otherwise, we're going to try to share that with every, everyone that's here in attendance today. Uh, you will receive a recording of this uh, copy once we're done compiling it. Uh, and if you don't get the email for some reason, you could actually find not only this session, but all our past webinar sessions within our user community. Uh, some of our older series, when we first started, you'll probably find them, with, find them within the Monarch Forum group. Uh, but any of the new ones that we've done recently, you'll find them in the knowledge base section under the webinars and presentations. So uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce you to my expert for today, Steve Kales. Uh, he's one of our senior professional services consultants. Uh, he's worked in the this technical role for almost 30 years, uh, 20 of it with our former Data Watch, part of the uh, including the Altair. He started off as a technical support engineer, moved on to our pre-sales consulting and training, and to now where he's uh, one of our senior professional service consultant. Uh, if you have not had the honor of working with him today, he's a great asset, not only to us internally, but obviously to our customer base. You'll probably see him also uh, share some responses within our user community. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Steve, make him presenter. And like I said, we're starting with that Monarch server overview with an input and output distribution. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen. Yep, I see your Monarch yep. server. Great, thank you. Okay, so yeah, um, just um, before we go into today's topic, uh, which is the overview of um, of a process with some uh, distributions, uh, just need to pick up on, on a couple of points that uh, we covered in our previous session. Um, so those of you that were on the session will remember uh, Mo came across a, an issue where there was a, a button missing from the export. So uh, when you went into uh, export and export design, um, if you have a model that contains filters or summaries, then you have the ability to, um, to to export that and sort of burst that summary out. So let me just get to the screen where I can show uh, show the issue. Uh, so standard filter, um, you, you can just browse to the file, and you have this little button here that allows you to browse out and find the the location um, and an existing file if there is one to overwrite. Uh, if you change this to all filters, or if, if we were exporting a summary, um, we selected all summaries, we have two choices. We can either burst the data out into separate tables or um, separate files um, in, in a folder. And if you select the files, you'll notice there's no browse icon here. Um, so it, it's been um, recognized and, and it will be fixed, um, but, but currently there is no browse button available. So um, the, the way to get around that is um, it, it, it's, it's quite easy, um, but there's just one little uh, 
sort of got you in there that might be there. So we can, of course, just uh, manually modify this path. So if I wanted to export to, to list the location here, for example, I can just copy it and paste that location in. Um, but you'll notice it's, it's red, which of course is an error condition. So if you are modifying it, just make sure you type the uh, the trailing backslash for the folder name and, and you'll have manual control over that folder. So uh, apologies for not having the pros button there, um, but as I say, you can manually correct that and put the backslash in. So just wanted to quickly update on that. Um, I say it has been um, reported and, and will be fixed, um, but currently that's the situation. So I'm not going to save any of that. Uh, and I'm afraid we also, I also have a second um, admission um, to, to make here. Uh, when uh, we were demonstrating the desktop product uh, last or two weeks ago, um, Mo was using version 2021.1 of the desktop products, and we were expecting imminently the uh, the server release uh, 2021. Uh, we were expecting at the time um, for there to be full parity. So the features, um, th those features I've just shown there of bursting out the file um, on all filters or, or all summaries, uh, we were expecting to be in the server version that was released. Um, unfortunately, it didn't make it into to that first initial release. So the desktop product is 2021.1, the latest. Um, and as you can see, the latest server product is 2021.0. Um, so we don't have the 0.1 functionality in Automator at the moment. Um, and th that is pretty much only the uh, the bursting by all filters and all summaries. But uh, I think we did specifically say that we were expecting that to be supported in Automator, um, but, but I have to correct that. Um, so uh, the, the general rule applies that, that you should always match the version of Automator um, to the version of your desktop software. So if you do have Automator, um, it, you're best sticking with 2021.0 of the desktop software. Um, you should be okay if you've got 0.1. But if you use those new features like the bursting, uh, you, you just won't be able to use that bursting uh, when you come to, to automate it. Um, that's only applicable to, to Data Prep Studio, by the way, with the workspaces. Uh, the classic models um, have had that bursting support for some time, and, and that is fully supported in Automator, in, in, in previous versions of Automator as well. So just relevant for Data Prep Studio. So on to um, today's topic. Uh, which is a review of uh, processes and, and distributions. Um, so starting completely from the beginning. So we have a, a new installation of Automator here, um, basically done, done nothing to this at all. So uh, just want to quickly describe the two areas that we'll be looking at um, in, in today's session or, or the, the main part of today's session. Uh, the first thing is the server library. And this is where um, we can store projects, models, and workspaces are the main three things. Uh, projects and models relate to uh, Classic, and workspaces relate to Data Prep Studio. So these sections are all empty at the moment, so we're not starting with any, any preconditions set. Um, so we will be putting things into the server library as we build these processes, but for now, the server library is empty. Uh, Automator has two types of process. We have the standard process, um, and this has been around since um, version 11, I believe, uh, we, we went to this interface. Um, standard processes are um, historically, uh, we only had classic at the time when, when it was launched. So standard processes can be used to automate Monarch Classic models and projects, and they cannot be used to automate Data Pro Studio workspaces. Uh, we now have the new interface, which um, I, I would recommend, unless you're heavily already heavily invested in standard processes, um, I would recommend anything new you do, you certainly take a look at using the visual processes. You have more control, um, and, and it's a nicer interface, in my view. It's a nicer interface to, to work in. Uh, visual processes can be used to automate uh, classic models and projects as well, or classic models, I should say more correctly. Um, and of course, they can be used to automate um, DPS workspaces. Uh, but I'll go through both because um, you know, we have a, a lot of customers that are heavily invested in standard processes. And in that case, it, it may make sense to keep everything in, in one interface. So let's start off um, by building a, a standard process. So there's nothing in there at the moment. So uh, the first thing we do, what, what we'll expect to see is eventually is a list of all of our processes up here. Um, so I'm going to have to back out of this for a moment or two, but just quickly, uh, we'll go into the, the list of processes and we'll add a process. And you can see really that there's nothing much to do on this um, on this process screen. 
Um, I think I hit the wrong button there, sorry, my mistake. Sorry, this is the screen I was expecting to see. Um, so you can see that there, there's nothing really to do um, on this uh, add a process screen. Um, and really at this stage, uh, the process is just a list of project files. Uh, so a project file in Monarch in, um, Standard, Monarch Classic, is um, it is a collection of uh, the report files that we're going to open up, the model that we're going to apply to those uh, report files or, or database files, um, and what we want to do with them, where we want to export them, and, and how we want to create that export. Uh, so that project definition can be created separately in Monarch Classic. And if we already had the project, we could just upload it into Automator and, and very quickly uh, automate an existing project. Um, I don't have that existing project at the moment, so I've got nothing, I've got no project to add. So in this case, the first thing I need to do is to create the project. Two places we can create the project. We can do it in, um, in Monarch Classic straight away. Um, or if you're an Automator customer, you may as well, um, in my view, you may as well use the, the interface that comes with Automator. Uh, you get all of the Automator specific functionality there, such as distributions, wildcard inputs. Um, and again, I think it's just an, a slightly nicer layout than, than uh, you would get if you were creating it in Classic. But a Classic project that you've already got, so an XPRJ or a DPRJ file, um, you could load straight away. You wouldn't have to create it, recreate it in Automator. But um, for here, we're gonna start from scratch. We're gonna go into the project editor, and of course we have to give it a, a name. Um, and then we, we have to give it a model, an input, and an export. Uh, the other options, uh, the other um, headings are uh, optional. So we'll go into models and verifications. We need to tell it which model to use. So we browse though um, to find the model. Uh, again, there's a couple of choices here. Uh, you can see in this folder here on the um, on, on this happens to be on this same server, but of course this could be a network drive. Uh, you can see I've got a model. This dmod file is the model. Uh, so I could, if I wished, um, browse out and find the model directly on the file system. So we could leave this on local. We can pick the server name, and then I can browse out and same, find that exactly the same folder there. Uh, basic test files, uh, models. So, so there's the model file. So if I browse to it this way, you can see there in the pop-up, it's making a, a physical link to that file. So for this process to work or this project to work, that model file, that model file needs to remain in this location uh, with the same name. And of course, if we modify the model file, then the process that uses that model is, is going to take on any changes that we make to the model. So this can be a very quick and convenient way. If, if, you're, um, if you have a fairly limited number of automator administrators, this can be a quick and easy way of, of modifying it and everything's kept under control. Um, the problem is that if you've got lots of different administrators and you've got lots of models in lots of different places, you can imagine this can very quickly get uh, get cumbersome. So what we recommend doing is rather than browsing out to local files, uh, which is effectively what you do in Monarch, uh, we would recommend using the server library. Uh, the advantage of the server library is that it, it sucks that model into the database so it becomes uh, stored centrally. Uh, you get version control with that. Uh, you get um, a much easier to implement security model. Um, and uh, and you get access to the bulk editor. So if you want to make um, bulk changes, maybe to, to the path of a lookup file or something like that, uh, then you can use the bulk editor to change all of your models in one go. Whereas if you've got them on the file system, um, you do have the, the desktop tool, but you've still got to go through every every folder location and, uh, and apply that desktop tool to make those bulk changes. The server library is much better for management. So that's what we'll do here. Um, I'm gonna pick it up from the server library as I mentioned, the server library at the moment is empty and you can see there's nothing there. So the first time I use this model that I've created in Classic, I need to add that model to the server library. Uh, and again, this can be um, you know, any folder path. Um, uh, where are the models? And that's the same model we were looking at just now. So I'm going to just add that to the root folder. You can create a folder structure if you want to, but just for now, I'm going to add it to the root folder. Select that model. This is now in the server library. And you can see uh, from, from this screen, you can tell it's a server library object because it has this reference and the friendly name underneath it. Uh, if I was picking it up from the file system, I would see the path to, to that file in this location here. So remember now it's in the server library. So in theory, I could delete this file 
um, and well, not in theory, I could delete this file um, and the, the project will still run because it's accessing the, the model from the server library. So of course that means you lose the ability to quickly make changes to this model with Monarch um, and, and then automatically have that applied. You'd have to make those changes and then bring it back into the server library if you wanted to modify that. Or you can in fact um, connect Monarch directly to the server library uh, as, as though it's part of the file system. So uh, it, it, it's not, once you get used to that new uh, procedure, it, it's, it's not a problem. So, so remember now it's in the server library, I don't need this anymore. And I can now go on to the other uh, sort of the quicker and more straightforward bits of uh, telling it what file I want to use. So I'm going to add in this case a text input. And again, this can be a local where I, I can I can browse out to it using the uh, the server location, uh, or I can use a named path. This can be any path um, on on the network uh, that the automator server has access to. Um, so I use a named path in this case. So that C A T E is the the same folder we're looking at. I'm going to go to the input folder and I'm going to pick a file and uh, because I'm doing this in Automator rather than the desktop product, I can use Automator functionality um, such as using a wildcard here so that we'll pick up all files that match class star.prn. I wouldn't be able to use that functionality if I was building this project file in the desktop product. So it, I'm going to pick up all files, in this case three files called class star.prn. I'm not going to go for the distribution for the moment, just skip straight on to the export. And I'm going to add an export. And uh, we're just going to go through here and, and uh, you can see that same as if you're building the export in, uh, in Monarch Classic, we can export from the table or the summary window. So I'll export from the table. Uh, no filter or sort in this case. So exporting to the file system would be things like creating an Excel file, CSV, uh, Acrobat PDF file. Uh, you can see I also have the OLEDB provider. Again, this is an automator only functionality. So you, you would not have the OLEDB functionality in, uh, um, in Classic. So that's another advantage of building it in the automator. Um, so I'm going to export to the file system. I'm going to browse again. We've got all the same thing. We can we can just type a path in, copy and paste. We can browse locations, um, or we can browse name paths. So let's. Um, I didn't create an output folder actually, so I'm just going to put it into the basic test files for now, um, and let's call it uh, standard because it's from a standard process. Um, dot xlsx for example so the file extension you type there will denote the file you create so xlsx xl um, xls sorry um, accdb uh, all, all the sort of you know, pdf file extensions just type in the extension you want you don't need to separately choose the file type and uh, if the file exists i'm going to overwrite it um, because it's an excel file uh, we have to give it a table name or leave it as untitled for speed um, export all. Uh, this only makes sense if you're appending data. Um, so uh, we're, we're not, there's nothing to append, there's no mapping to do at the moment, so I'm just going to click next. And again, because it's a, uh, an Excel file, you get some additional signature and drop down and pivots and all that sort of thing. So again, just for, for this part of it, I'll click on finish. So, so that's it. Um, that, that's the basis of, um, of a project created. Remember the, uh, the compulsory parts are we must have a model, we must have an input, and we must have at least one export. And, and that's really as, um, as straightforward as a, as a project can be. I'm going to commit this, which means it's going to get saved into the server library. Uh, it's not possible to save the projects um, directly to the file system uh, using the project editor. Um, and then save. So this is now my project in the project server library, as you can see. So that's the, the hard bit done. The easy bit is now using this project uh, in, the, uh, uh, in Automator. So we'll go into Automator, we'll go into Process, and add a process. And now I can add the project that I've just created. I need to give it a name. And we just add. Uh, from the server library, uh, again, you, you can add a project locally if you want to, but from the server library, there's the classic project that I've uh, just created. And and that's it. So it's building the project that takes the time, really, uh, not, not the process, typically. So if we now uh, run this and go to the jobs, 
we can see uh, it's already run and complete without errors. Um, it's obviously a fairly fairly small file here. Um, so uh, we've taken the uh, taken the inputs. So there were three inputs we've taken, um, and uh, there's the standard XLSX file that's just been created. So I don't have Excel installed on this machine, but uh, it's just created the Excel file. So pro uh, projects can be very straightforward and processes can be very straightforward in that way. You're just literally just telling it to open up some files, apply a model and export the results. Um, but typically we would then want to add some distributions because if I run this uh, job again now, you can see it's, it's running again and it's again, it's completed without errors. And if we look at the standard XLS, you can see 1552, it's been overwritten. So, so this is just almost sort of stuck in a circle here because we're not distributing uh, particularly the inputs. Uh, the inputs are just sitting in this folder here and, and will never get moved, will never get tagged, we'll never know whether they've been run or not. Uh, so typically we would add some distributions to the process. So I'm going to come back into the processes. It, distributions are actually done in the project. So I could go into the server library and edit the project in the server library. Um, but you sort of have to know um, which process it belongs to here if you're trying to find it. Of course, a, a description would help, um, which I didn't add. Um, but another way um, is you can come into the process and get to it from, from this side. So we know which process we want to modify. Uh, there's the project. And here's the arrow to, uh, to edit that project. So there's two different types of distribution. Uh, you can see here straight away we have an input distribution. We don't see the uh, the other type of distribution, which is in the exports at the moment. So we go into an input distribution, and what we'll do just for speed is we'll just delete the input files. So we can only ever run this process once against the files. So I'm going to add an action, and I'm just going to delete the files. Nothing else to choose there. And then if we go on to exports, this is where we do the, the second distribution. Um, so you can see uh, we can have multiple exports here. We only have one, um, but there are no export distributions. So we have to choose which export we're going to add the distribution to. So you can imagine we are exporting the table here. You could have a separate export that um, exports the summary, and you may want to do different distributions, put those in different folders. So the distributions belong to the individual export. So we click the export to highlight it and now add a distribution. And in this case, I'll do a, a move distribution. So we'll move the file uh, to the done folder. And uh, maybe we'll even add a, a, a date timestamp in there. So we'll create a new folder every day by using these macros. So year, month, day, and then we'll create the file in a, in a date. Um, date stamped folder automatically. So it will create the folder if it doesn't exist, of course. Um, and I'll just set that to overwrite in case I'll run it twice. So you can see the input files are still there. Um, there's no date timestamp in the done folder. If we now commit those changes to the server library, so we'll have the revision there, we'll have the, the previous version as well if we need to go back to it and now run that process again. So job running, it should be complete pretty much straight away. There we go. So you go, you'll see now in my input folder, um, the, the files have been deleted as we asked, that's the input distribution. And in the export folder, it would have initially gone into the done folder, but then we've got the distribution that creates the date timestamp and, and moves that folder into that date timestamp folders for, for us. So that, that's just a quick overview of, um, of distributions on a uh, on a standard process. So we certainly have have good functionality in there for doing that. Um, but we'll move on to the uh, the, the visual process um, as, as the next stage. So um, just having a quick check. I don't think there's any any there, there are some questions coming in which I'll come on to, um, but there's no questions relating to this specific part of the process at the moment. So I'll go on to the uh, the visual processes. So very similar process. Um, there are no visual processes. 
I think um, the, the interface is, is slightly nicer in my view, but um, I guess that's, that's for you to decide, not for me. Um, so we'll go into the visual process and uh, you can see a visual process can be used to automate data prep and classic, whereas a standard process can only be used to automate classic. So I'll repeat th those steps in uh, classic first of all. Um, slight difference here in that we have to decide whether we're choosing a file model or a server library model. We don't get that drop down on the browse. So this time I'm going to choose that server library model I've already got. So the model this time is already in the server library, so I don't have to load it again, but of course I could add a new one. And then we'll export, again we can choose either the table or the summary, so I'll export the table in this case. Just drag the two together. And you can see now that this is dynamic, so there's no returns. This is the name of a filter that's defined in our um, in our library, in our model. So, so this is dynamic now relating to whatever model you're using. Uh, so again, uh, we'll, um, we'll export no filter, no sort, we'll choose the destination, and uh, we'll go to the name path, ATE, I'm sorry, uh, and let's help basic test file, sorry, I've got the folder. And we'll call this one uh, Visual Classic dot um, XLSX. Um, so again, I'll just leave everything else on the default um, and then OK that. So at, at the moment, this doesn't contain quite enough information. You remember the other part of the project was the input files that we want to apply to the model library. Um, so we need to, to do that bit. And that's the sort of the third compulsory part of the project in effect. So we're redefining the project um, in, in this visual process. And, and that was the reason for my comment. If you're heavily invested in projects, it's easier to use those pre-existing projects in a classic process because all you have to do is to open up the project file. Whereas in a visual process, you have to recreate the steps of that project. So let's just choose the files from the name path. ATE, basic files, input. Uh, of course, I deleted them. The previous job deleted them. So fortunately, I have a master folder here where we've got them all copied. So let me put them back in the input folder and just refresh that. And again, of course, we can use the wildcard here. And uh, that's it for a standard, uh, sorry, for a visual process without any uh, distributions. So we can now run this um, visual classic. And uh, the, the advantage of the visual process is you can actually see it running. You can see these buttons, these icons flashing, which uh, you can imagine if it's a more complex process, you can sort of follow the, the flow through. And you also get the log file reported directly to you. You don't have to go between the two different sections like we do with a, a standard process. So if I stay in log mode a second here, you can see we've got the flow of the process. Uh, we've got the table event it has exported the 271 rows. The file input event, has you can see, has picked up the three files. So this tells you everything that's, uh, that's going on, um, just like a standard process. Um, but again, there's no distributions here, so we just keep on running this and it's going to keep on doing the same job. So uh, th this is where I think you really start to get into the advantages of a, of a visual process, um, because you have much more control over the, the flow and where things happen and, and how things happen. So we drag a distribution in, but you notice now it's no longer uh, an input distribution or an export distribution. Uh, we can choose. So when I drag this uh, table export on, or just something actually just to review before that, uh, we could, um, and it's sort of tempting to think because we're exporting the input file, maybe we should join the input file to the distribution. The problem is now you see there's no flow uh, through here. So what's going to happen is it, it's going to work down both of these in parallel. And whatever distribution we put on here is going to run in parallel with the export. So if we're trying to delete the input files, they're going to get deleted before the model has had a chance to export and create the table. So we shouldn't connect it um, directly here. We should export it. Uh, we should do the distribution after we've exported it, after we finish with the files. 
and then just make sure when we click on that to get the details, you can see we can now choose what it is we want to distribute it, uh, what we want to distribute. So in this case, I'm going to distribute the file input, the name of the node here, so the, the three uh, class star.pom files, and again, I'll just delete them. And now we can add a second distribution, which we can either do in parallel or we can do in series. And this can be the, the move distribution. So again, very, um, the same things really that we had in the classic uh, process. So I'm going to create, and just for speed, I'm going to put those into the basic test um, done folder. And I'll just choose the folder here instead of using the world cards, but uh, you can obviously use the macros as well. Uh, I'm going to overwrite that file for a second. Ah, okay, so this exclamation mark here is telling me I've forgotten to do something. Um, and what I forgot to do was to tell it what I want to distribute as, and in this second distribution. So it's the table export, the, the XLSX file that I want to distribute here. And again, let's run that again. And we can uh, stay in the log mode just to take a quick look at, at what's going on. So again, you can see it's worked through all the um, all the events here. Uh, the file input has the three files. The distribution, I should have named these really, but you can see distribution on its own is the first one, uh, which is deleting the three files. And the second distribution is the, uh, the, the move. So exactly as we'd have expected, but I think it's much more logical to work out what's going on here. Um, in, in a visual process. So I want to quickly go through um, a visual process using a workspace, um, and then we'll have a look at some of the advanced features that you can do or the supplemental features you can do in a visual process. Um, they also apply back to, um, to a standard process. So you'll be able to use the next set of features anywhere. Um, and, and it's a clear advantage, I feel, over the, uh, over the classic process. So let's um, save that. And we'll create uh, another um, simple process using the uh, uh, using a workspace. Uh, add a new process. So this time, of course, we're going to bring a workspace in instead of a classic model. And I'm going to browse out and find the workspace. Um, here, uh, the, the workspace must be in the server library. So that's one difference between um, automating a classic task and a, a, a data approach studio task. With classic, you remember we have the choice. It can either be in the server library or on the file system. So for data approach studio, it must be in the server library, um, which is not at the moment. So first time I have to go out and add it, click new, and bring it into the server library, into the root folder again. And, and again, you can see we've got an exclamation mark here. Um, exclamation marks generally is, is not, not necessarily an error, but it's a, a warning that um, Automate has not been able to resolve for us um, at the time we're building the process. So uh, the reason we've got a warning here is because this workspace was developed on a, a different machine. It wasn't developed directly on the server. Um, and it's looking for a file in uh, in a OneDrive folder, as you can see here, and that OneDrive folder and that path does not exist on this server. Um, so, of course, if I try and run this process, it's going to say that it can't find the input file. So if the workspace had been developed using a path that was available, the network path that both yourself and the automator server can see, then you wouldn't need to do anything else necessarily and you wouldn't have the ex exclamation mark here. But in this case, I do. So I choose the file input and um, choose the location that the server can see. So again, it's going to be a name path here, uh, basic test files, input. And I think once again, they're deleted, aren't they? So let me grab them. And again, of course, you can use the wildcard. You don't have to, but uh, that's a, an automator functionality. And now when we drag these two together, uh, you'll see we've still um, currently got the exclamation mark here. Um, but now I have the choice. I can come down here and I've got a new drop down arrow that wasn't previously there. And I can drop down and select the, the file input. So whatever path I've specified on this node. And uh, now the exclamation mark has gone.
And the final thing I need to do is to export the data. Again, this is pretty much the same as it would be uh, for uh, uh, classic, of course. And name path 88. Let's go to the done folder. And there's dps.csv, for example. Let's do a CSV file this time instead of Excel. Um, and uh, everything else can stay uh, as the default. So once again, if we run that, um, you, you'll, you'll see uh, it, it's very much uh, the same as a, a, a visual process using classic models. Okay, so I'm just going to check everything's running okay. So again, there's no distributions on here at the moment. Um, everything's worked, the process is complete. Um, and there you can see that there's the file being created. Um, so I'm just going to add one distribution. I won't delete the input file uh, this time because uh, I'm going to run this one a couple of times, but obviously I could. So I'm just going to add a distribution, um, this time to move uh, the files in, into, uh, in, into that done date timestamp folder. Uh, and again, I've forgotten to choose which file I add it to. Uh, let me just reconnect that. Uh, so it's the export that I'm going to move in this case. And now the exclamation mark has gone. Uh, run that so that saves it first and then runs it. And there's the CSV file that we've just uh, just created. Um, so let's pop back into designer mode, and I just want to go on to the um, the, the sort of really useful uh, extra functionality you get with the visual process. Um, so you can see what we've got here. Um, this distribution is going to move that file into the done folder, um, and it's got when destination file exists uh, raise error. Um, so it's not this bit specifically that I wanted to mention. I just wanted to point out that if we run this again, it is going to create an error. So if I run this one straight away once more, it's going, the input files are still there. It's going to create the export file. And now it's going to try and distribute that back into the same folder. But because a file with the same name already exists, um, it, you see it's got the error distributing. So of course, we could fix that by setting that to overwrite. Um, but the reason I wanted to point this out is to, to show the, um, the advanced connectors and to, um, the additional flow that you get using a, 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 a visual process. So if you right click anywhere on a spare bit of canvas and use this show advanced connectors, you can see I get these additional paths. Uh, these red arrows are the, the interesting ones. This is the path it will take if something goes wrong. So if it's not able to complete the export, for example, um, or if you tried to send an email distribution and the email server was not available, uh, you now get this sort of dynamic flow depending on whether the operation has been successful or not. So if I had a distribution here, um, just called uh, failed, just so we can see it in the log file easily. And I'm just going to leave it as a log distribution for now. But of course, it could be an email, it could be moving, it could be doing something completely different. But for now, let's just get it doing a log. And I'm going to connect my failure arrow to that log file. And then we'll have a an OK, which again, I'll also have as a log and have an OK and connect it. So let me just delete that output file for a second, delete them all for speed and run it again. So this time the process is going to be OK because the file doesn't exist. You can see it's doing the export. Um, it'll do the distribution. And you can see um, the, the OK one is highlighted. And the distribution event, the failed event has not triggered. You've got zero events. But the OK event, in this case, has written the log file or could have sent the email or could have copied the files, whatever we wanted it to do. If I rerun it, it's trying to do or it is doing the export. It's going to try the distribution. 
This time the distribution has failed because the file already exists, but more importantly here, you can see the path has gone down the failed, and this time we've got the failed distribution that's been triggered, and the OK distribution has not been triggered. So this, this is not just relevant for distributions, uh, this could also go on to do lots of other things. I'm just going to move these to give myself a bit more room. Excuse my uh, my design skills there. Um, so uh, you can see we've got these two paths now. So of course, th th this could then go on to do other things. So you might want to, if everything's OK, go on and do maybe a completely separate workspace. So we can bring a second workspace down. In this case, I've only got one workspace in the server library. So for speed, I'll just click the same one again. Um, so what we can now do is, is run this second workspace, but only if the first workspace has successfully exported and distributed it to where we expect it to be. Uh, one little thing to note if you are trying this, uh, you can't drag and drop it on the workspace directly. Um, so these arrows have to go between uh, nodes that are actually doing something. So like a distribution is doing something, uh, an export is is um, doing something. So you see, I, I could sort of loop it back around here, be a bit strange, but could be done. Um, but a workspace isn't actually doing anything itself. It's information for the export, but it's the export that's doing something. So what we'd have to do is to um, bring the export down here. And it's the export that we would join that to. And of course, we have to join the, the workspace to the export as well so that it knows what it's exporting. Uh, but just, just bear that in mind. Um, it, it's not always necessarily what you might think would be the next step in the process that you connect to. It's the next step that does something. Um, so you can see this gives you the ability now to, to have a much more complex flow than you would get with a standard process. And uh, that, 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 in my view, is a, is a good, good reason for using. Uh, using these visual processes. You can import a visual process um, automatically, uh, although it, it's often easier to recreate it. Um, but let me just quickly uh, do that one. I'm just coming back to processes. Um, so uh, migrate standard process. So that process we created just now, I can click and I can migrate. And it's now available um, here in this uh, this standard process. Um, but uh, you can see it, it's got it's got more than it needs. So we don't really need this hub. We don't need the model verification because we weren't using that in the standard process. Um, but it, it's everything that the standard process was doing is now being done um, in this visual process. So whether you prefer to do that or whether you prefer to, to quickly build it just using the three or four icons that, that you would need is obviously a, a personal choice, um, but you don't have to recreate everything from scratch if you don't want to. Okay, so so that, that concludes um, the uh, the process review. So uh, let me just see if there's any, any questions on that part of it, uh, which I don't see. Um, so I'll go on to um, a, a, to a, a generalized question, um, which is on on joining uh, joining different account names uh, using using fuzzy matches. Um, so let me come into Data Pouch Studio. So for everyone, the question was, how does DPS help with fuzzy matches between two files or tables? For example, an AR aging and an AP aging, looking for the AR uh, Contra account names. Thanks. So I'm just quickly okay. trying to trying to find a data set that can show this quickly without me having to recreate it. Um, training files. Okay, I'm just going to drag a uh, um, training set a, a file set here. Okay, so there, there's a couple of um, of sets of data here, um, and I think I can just drag uh, a couple of them. Um, in order to demonstrate this. So I think the pension contribution, 
I can open up and I'm not sure where that particular person I want to include is in this data set so I'm just going to very quickly go through here and open up all the data sets if you'd like to see this in more detail, we can add this as a as a vote topic um, for for a future reference um, to see what I'm actually doing here. Um, I'm rushing and doing it wrong. My apologies. No, no, it's still working. Okay. Okay, this is this is not not the neatest way to bring these in because I'm uh, I'm trying to get to the bit of, of the joining here. Um, let's just try and append these for a second. Okay, let's see if that's going to be enough. Not straight away. Just need to make a quick change to that, and then hopefully I think it'll be the, the data will be close enough to uh, to show. Uh, show how to do that um, so, uh, I know I don't have it there should have named these fields sorry <laughs> don't you're probably gonna yeah. mention it Steve but like the benefit of of the fuzzy is that you know DPS will help potentially with misspelling of errors. So if like someone's yeah. last name is a Smith and someone added an E at the end, it will kind of give you that close similarity. It's got a... It, it, a exactly, yeah. I, I, I wanted to actually actually show it. Show um, it, and, yeah. Uh, where, no, um, but unfortunately, agree. yeah. This, this data set is not going to uh, not going to allow me to do that quickly, unfortunately. So I can go through the steps, but it's not... The results are not going to, to uh, uh, make a huge amount of... Uh, of of use to us. Um, so what you would do is, is you go into combine and you choose your two data sets. So explicitly the question was looking for uh, an aging list and a, and a contra list. So imagine we've got our aging list uh, which we can drag across into one side and our contra list drag across onto the second side. Uh, we click to join and then we would choose um, choose the, the matching column so I can't even tell which the matching columns are here but uh, let's say the, um, the 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 account name um, I guess it needs to be matched on uh, you'd have in both columns they don't have to be the same um, field name of course uh, so if you use um, any of these inner outer joins by default they're going to be exact match um, but we do have this uh, use fuzzy matching text for column pairs. And, and as Rebecca mentioned, what this allows you to do is to account for um, uh, grammatical changes. So um, if punctuation is missing, if the capitalization is different, um, well, you, you could probably ignore capitalization, I guess, but punctuation, spacing, uh, typos, um, if it's an OCR product, a sort of a one instead of a zero, a one instead of an I and that sort of thing, uh, you could probably match using fuzzy matching. So, so this is the key here. Uh, join your tables as normal, as though you're expecting an exact match. Um, and then tick this fuzzy matching. And you can see you have a threshold here. So the 100% threshold, basically it means it must be identical. So that's the same as having it turned off. And you can scroll all the way down to, to the most relaxed, which is zero. If zero still doesn't match everything. Um, it, it still has to be a, a sort of a reasonable match, but it's the most relaxed um, it, it gets down to based on this threshold. Um, and you can also um, add this fuzzy matching result here. Uh, so you can actually see how close it is. So uh, one useful thing can be to scroll it all the way down to zero, um, include the, the columns. Now, I guess I'm not going to match anything here at all here, but uh, yeah, so I can't even see the results. Um, I guess if I change it to an outer join, I might be able to see the results. Oh, a negative join, sorry. Uh,
yeah, you don't see the results because it's a negative join. For us, he's not matching for for negative joins, I guess. But uh, what what you would see is um, on the percent match here, uh, you would see the um, the the sort of 20, 40, 60, 80 percent match, and by gauging that you could then come back in and fine tune your, your threshold um, to however you want it to be. So apologies for not having a data set ready there to show that, but hopefully that, that shows the principle. Um, so the main thing is uh, just tick this fuzzy matching box in, in the join. Um, okay, uh, any other questions? I don't see any questions in the live panel. Nope, there's none. Um, if anyone wants to ask, I know we have a couple minutes. Um, if you want to raise your hand, we can give you the mic if you want to ask in person. Or if you're too shy, uh, please feel free to. OK, Jack, give me one second, Jack. I will unmute you so you can ask if that's OK. Uh, how do I do this? Give me. All right, there you go. Uh, good morning. Um, if I am looking at in in Automator the list of visual processes that I have, mm -hmm. is is there a way to introduce folders or somehow organize them? Right now, I just have one big long list. Right. Um, so so yeah, the visual processes are um, as you say, just in in one long list. So uh, we do have a concept of folders in the server library. Um, which, but, but even then, to be honest, when you look at it in the server library, it's just one long list, but it means when you're retrieving models and projects or workspaces, uh, you can navigate down through the folder structure. Um, but I, I, um, I, I think that there was talk of, of adding folders to processes, um, but at, at the moment, uh, that there is no folder structure available in, in this screen here, I'm afraid, no. Yeah, so, okay. so um, the, the only way would be to, um, I, I guess, to maybe um, use, use the search function. Um, yeah, no, I don't, don't think there'll be an easy way of doing that, I'm afraid. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> um, yep. Thank you, Jack. Two minutes, so before everyone starts to jump off, uh, got to launch that poll question. Select the topic that we'd like to cover for our next upcoming Ask the Webinar, or Ask the Expert. Um, so if your screen is at a full capacity, you'll want to minimize it in order to make a selection. So would you guys like to see report redaction, the analyze tab with the summaries, review those projects in classic mode, uh, perhaps a template type overview, go over the different uh, templates. Um, and then again, we have that option of the other a uh, topic that when this webinar does close, we send out a little quick survey um, or you can feel free to comment on what else we can provide and recommend, uh, as well as there's a section where you can put in the topic you'd like to review. And we'll try to make that as a, as a choice to vote on. So I'm gonna give a couple more seconds here. And I'll do a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. And let me have a couple more last slides that I want to um, show. And also, we're going to run our little random winner. So those are familiar with. So again, uh, that PowerPoint that's in the handout section, you'll have a copy of these uh, web links and resources. Our email for the customer success team is kw at csm at altair.com. This is that community interface. Again, if you haven't registered, I highly recommend come and sign up. You could also see that's where you'll be able to contact our support team. Within the forums, you'll locate the Monarch forum. In fact, I believe the team is getting ready to launch a Monarch server forum. So you'll have two, you'll have Monarch server specifically uh, related information. And then our knowledge base, as I mentioned, those past webinars. So once you, even though you sign up, I recommend come and hit subscribe 
what this does is that when anyone posts or answer a question, a discussion, uh, you'll receive an email notification. So if it's a topic of interest, you'll be able to click and review it further, or you can <laughs> disregard if it doesn't apply to you. Uh, if your organization hasn't had the opportunity to schedule a complimentary onboarding, we have those links there that you could uh, do. And I don't have a date or a topic yet, but I know our um, the marketing uh, team wants to present with our solution specialists, uh, kind of bring back our skill spotlights. Again, it's kind of similar to what we have, but it's a, you know, they kind of just drive right to a particular use case presentation. And then our next Ask the Expert is February 22nd. Uh, so please feel free to register. And now let me actually bring up my monarch and I'm going to run that random. So this is a list of our attendees today. Um, and as, as we've done, we'll do a little refresh. I'll run it about three times. I know right now we're not seeing the winner because don't want to tease anybody that you may have won. And that's the third time. So Jason. Jason, you're our lucky random winner for today's session. I will reach out to you directly and how to get that prize. So let me get back to that PowerPoint that I have. And again, I thank you all for joining. My goal is to try to get that uh, recording out to you by Friday. If not, we'll definitely have it on Monday and it will be posted in our user community in that webinars and presentation uh, section within the knowledge base. So thank you all again. Uh, any questions that we don't get to, we'll definitely try to reach out. Have a wonderful remaining of your day, and we look forward to you joining us next time. Thank you, Steve. Awesome job. Pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody.